Linux kernel in Debian Ben Hutchins. Okay. Uh, okay, first I'll just uh, briefly introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. Um, I've been working uh, professionally on software development since I left university in 1998. Um, I started contributing to Debian in about 2003 at uh, bug squashing parties and so on. Uh, I've been a regular com contributor to the Linux kernel since 2008 as part of my day job. Um, and around the same time, I started contributing to the, uh, the, the maintenance of the kernel in Debian as well. Uh, I've been uh, uh, officially a member of the kernel team and uploader since 2009. Uh, initially, I was trying to fix the issue of non-free firmware packaged in the kernel. Um, more about that later. Um, uh, now I'm triaging bugs, fixing bugs, I'm backporting features, updating the packaging, and really uh, dealing with everything involved in uh, the maintenance of the, of the various packages that we have. Um, I suspect you probably have, are aware of, of the uh, Linux kernel, just as a reminder. <laughs> Started in 1991 for i386 only and adopted uh, as, the, as the kernel of the Debian system in 1993 when we started. 20 years later, um, it now supports more hardware architectures and devices than anything else. If you look in the kernel source tree, there are 24 separate architectures, and that's even before you consider the 32-bit versus 64-bit variants or little engine versus big engine. Uh, if you would cancel those, there could be 40 or 50 architectures. Um, over 2,000 device drivers, uh, each of them supporting potentially very many devices. Uh, at this point, uh, users um, demand Linux support for hardware. The hardware vendors have to provide Linux drivers. Not always, uh, this always doesn't always make it into the um, official kernel releases, but there's always uh, going to be some sort of driver and today it's still the default kernel for the Debian system, although there's some competition now from K3BSD. Um, just a reminder about the Linux release model. Some people are still familiar with the old uh, way things were done. Uh, each stable release had a, uh, an even second component. So for example, 2.0, 2.2, 2.4, 2.6. The third component was then incremented for our stable releases, which were just fixing bugs uh, and adding some smaller features. The major development was then done in odd numbered uh, series, um, which would go on for a year or two, and then you'd have the next uh, stable release. And there was a big problem with this because users could wait for many years to get all these features um, that they were probably hearing about uh, being implemented in. Well, in 2.5, um, the, the users still on 2.4 were getting pretty frustrated. And then when 2.6 finally came out, oh, there were a huge number of features and a huge number of uh, uh, changes to the way they were used to doing things. And it was quite a painful, uh, quite a painful uh, transition there. Uh, so since Early in the 2.6 series, there's been a new, a new model has been adopted by uh, uh, Linus and the other kernel developers. We have a stable release, or fairly stable, every two or three months, um, with about five stable releases per year now. Um, the use of the Git uh, uh, version control system, and before that, BitKeeper, uh, made it a lot easier to do distributed development uh, and to stabilize uh, and to, to integrate and to stabilize uh, all these many changes over such a short period. Um, even so, there are still going to be bugs in each of these stable releases. So you, there's also a, a branch from each of these, um, which is then uh, number 2.6.x.y. Well, it has been up till now. Um, that usually lasts until just a little after the next stable release, but that's not always the case. Um, distributions like Debian like to support a single 
um, base kernel version for the entire lifetime of uh, a their stable releases, which are two or more years. Um, in, case, in the case of Red Hat and SUSE, it's even longer. So we now have the long-term uh, branches for uh, various uh, base upstream versions, including 2.6.32, which is the basis for Squeeze. Um, the, we're now up to, I think, 2.6.32.43, um, with a huge number of bug fixes. So you may be aware that Linux 3.0 uh, was just released. Um, unlike previous uh, major changes in the first two version components, that actually doesn't make a huge change uh, functionally. Really, it's just the version numbering changes. So X is uh, now the second component, and the Y for stable bug fixes is the third. So the first bug fix release will be after 3.0 will be 3.0.1, and the first and the next new stable release uh, from Linux will be 3.1. So a bit about the Debian kernel team. Uh, there are about five, uh, there are five general maintainers. Um, uh, Max Atoms, Bastian Blank, Dan Frazier, uh, Moritz Mühlenhoff, who's here in the audience, and me. But we have many more uh, contributors who are working on uh, specific areas, uh, architecture supports. Uh, for example, ARM and MIPS need some quite specialized, uh, they have specialized issues um, and, need, and need attention from an expert. Um, I know very little about Almond MIPS, for example. Um, and then we have people looking after specific features that they're uh, interested in. For example, we have uh, Ian Campbell, um, who has, is one of the upstream Zen developers, has done a lot of work on making Zen work well in Squeeze and subsequently. And we have uh, people who just do bug triage, and that's incredibly helpful. We would still could still do with more help. Um, bug triage, as I said, and PowerPC is one of those architectures that we still have quite a few users for, but we don't really have an expert in the kernel team. So it's been somewhat neglected. So the duties of the kernel team, um, not so different from those of uh, any packaging, uh, any packaging team, but there are a few, a few unusual things. Bug triage, we get a lot of bugs. We have about a thousand open bugs at the moment. Uh, it takes quite a lot of time to deal with uh, incoming bugs. Um, sometimes without a whole lot of information. For example, the system crashed. Um, and the user doesn't have any log. We've got to somehow uh, help them to get a log uh, or some sort of diagnostic information to understand what went wrong um, before we can make any progress at all. Uh, we've got a back port, bug fixes and features. Um, and in particular, for stable releases, we actually have to add features. Unlike most other packages, we do have to add support for new hardware because otherwise users cannot install uh, stable on their new hardware. At the same time, uh, with these bug fixes, we need to we want to avoid changing the kernel API because that's disruptive for anyone who's using uh, modules from uh, using out of tree third party modules. For every new upstream release, we need to uh, look again at the build configuration. There are a huge number of uh, build options for the kernel um, to enable uh, drivers, file systems, and other features. Sometimes these get reorganized and renamed between releases, and then if we're not careful, we drop a driver, uh, which is not very nice. Um, and we also have to ensure smooth upgrades. Um, there are some implementation changes that affect uh, other bits of the system, for example, uh, when we the kernel mode switching uh, transition, um, a whole lot of code for managing video devices was moved from drivers uh, that were part of the X server uh, into the drivers in the kernel, and so 
the old X drivers definitely would not work with kernel drivers that expect it to do mode switching. You can't have both of them doing it. So we had to do a bit of thinking about how we, how we ensure that uh, the user is never left with a, with a system where the uh, drivers are fighting over the, uh, their video devices. Uh, LibATO was another fun transition um, for boring technical reasons. A whole lot the uh, kernel device names for hard drives and CD-ROMs and tape drives all got changed. Um, so we had to try to fix up uh, all the configuration files that might mention those names. And sometimes we integrate features that were not accepted upstream, but we don't like doing that. The official Linux kernel packages, uh, the, main, uh, the main source package for these is Linux 2.6. Uh, at some point, we should be renaming that to just Linux. Uh, the binary package names produced by this change with each upstream version uh, and sometimes more frequently. This is because the, um, the kernel is kind of like a shared library in its relations to uh, out-of-tree modules. They, the, if you package out-of-tree modules, they will depend, need to depend on uh, kernel versions that provide specific API. So whenever the API changes, we need to change our package, uh, package name. So you have a huge number of um, binary packages whose names follow this format. These have the, the kernel and uh, all the modules we build for it. Then we have the development packages corresponding to that. There are a few more Linux headers packages which, uh, which have this common headers uh, because in fact most of those don't vary. Uh, we have headers for user land. Um, the C library defines most, basically wraps much of the system call uh, interface, but not all of it. So there are some, uh, some header files that get included by user land programs as well. Uh, we package the source with all our patches so that people can build custom kernels. Uh, we package the uh, upstream documentation. Uh, we package some uh, useful tools. Currently the main uh, tool there is Perf, which is a performance analysis for both kernel and user land. Um, if, you've not, if you've not seen that, check it out. It's quite useful. Um, and then this rather uninteresting package, which is used basically to support the, the Linux latest 2.6, which I'm going to talk about next. From this, we get meta packages and those um, make it easy to do uh, automatic upgrades across upstream versions, uh, despite the fact that the binary package names keep changing. These ones don't, so Linux image and the flavor. Uh, I should mention that the flavor here distinguishes the various different configurations that are available for an architecture. So for uh, the R3, I386, for example, we have the 486 flavor, which basically runs on any processor from 486 up. We have the 686 PAE flavor that runs on anything from the Pentium Pro up that supports uh, the physical address extension. And we have AMD 64, which runs on 64-bit processors. Um, other architectures, in other, on other architectures, there are some major differences in the basic hardware, which mean we need uh, different flavors f to do with, uh, for different kinds of, um, uh, basically for different kinds of motherboard. Uh, Linux headers flavor, similarly for the development, uh, development package, Linux source, Linux doc, Linux tools, and so on. So uh, if you install these, you can always have the latest version of uh, the latest version of the source, the documentation, perf. Um, the installer will, by default, it will install one of these meta packages. So you always get the latest kernel version uh, from uh, the suite that you installed. There are a few more packages. 
uh, that are built from separate source packages. Firmware 3 has a very small set, unfortunately, of firmware images uh, for which we have source and licenses that comply with uh, Debian free software guidelines. Uh, Linux base uh, contains some scripts that are shared by the various uh, kernel images. Um, there's also a perf wrapper there, which we'll call the right version of perf. Um, and that has some, that has scripts to handle uh, uh, transitions. For example, the libata transition. And finally, Linux kbuilds 2.6. This is separated out from the Linux 2.6 package because everything in Linux 2.6 can easily be cross-built without a uh, uh, without libc, and Linux Cable 2.6 cannot. But Linux Cable 2.6 actually supports cross-building. So that, yes, that's the, that's the kernel build system and that's a dependency of Linux headers files. So while these official packages work for most of our users, I think, I hope, um, some people need to do custom builds. Uh, for example, some ARM platforms need different configurations. Uh, they're not compatible, you can't, um, there's, that we can't come out with a build configuration which will work on uh, a whole variety of ARM platforms. We need a separate one for each, and we just can't. We can't cover them all. So then you would need a you would need a custom build for some. Uh, then some users want to enable new features in, uh, that are, we are, were added by upstream, but we're a little concerned that they're going to cause regressions, and we don't. Basically, we wait a few releases to see what the fallout is, see if they get bug fixed. Um, uh, some people are eager to try them straight away, so they can do that. Um, simplest way is using the the, uh, the usual make and make install. Well, there's also a configuration step in there, but anyway. Um, there's also an upstream target called dev package. Um, which is maintained by uh, various Debian developers have contributed to that. Um, there's also the old kernel package, package, uh, which provides the make k package command that enables a little more customization. Um, I don't know how necessary that is now, but that, I should point out, is not maintained by the kernel team. So going back to those, those extra features that we sometimes integrate, uh, as with any package, we don't really want to be carrying large patches uh, that haven't been accepted upstream, um, because then we're left with the burden of uh, re merging those with upstream every time we take a new upstream version. Um, but sometimes there are big features that are really quite important and uh, we feel we have to. Uh, we feel we have to include those. So previously we had OpenVZ and vServer, which were kind of uh, kernel-level virtualization systems. Um, they let you have virtual machines um, without their own kernels. These. Um, most of the functionality of this has now been re-implemented in upstream Linux uh, through the C groups and namespaces features. So these, um, although those aren't complete replacements, we've 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 dropped we've dropped these features um, after squeeze. Uh, there will be no more releases with with these extra features. Um, Zen, um, the story is much better. Uh, Zen basically got merged upstream. Uh, Linux 3.0 will run in DOM 0 um, and can provide uh, networking and block backends, uh, which I think is, is uh, basically we're there, right, Ian? Uh, Debian Live 
really needs a union file system, and so far there's no union file system upstream. Um, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of proposals, and it just hasn't happened yet. Um, so f for now, we're carrying the AUFS packages, uh, patches. Um, thankfully, the AUFS developer is is keeping those up to date with upstream, so um, that's not too much of a headache. Um, then there's the real-time patches for preempt RT. Um, the effect of the real-time patches is to limit the maximum latency for uh, responding to events, which is uh, it's useful for industrial control, it's useful for um, audio, uh, audio mixing and creation, um, and there are also some uh, financial services companies that are doing uh, uh, some very clever tricks, and they also want real-time features. Um, these features are gradually being merged upstream, um, and there's the remaining features uh, that are not upstream are, they're actually quite a small patch set. Um, so for the, um, the Debian package of Linux 3.0, uh, we've actually added uh, an RT uh, feature set, uh, currently for the MB64 architecture only, but if people are interested in RT on other architectures, um, we may be able to add that. So. So I have a question for, uh, from IRC. Um, could you comment on the status of LXC and Debian and upstream compared to OpenVZ? He said that some functionalities are miss missing. Which ones? I don't know. It's not my area. Sorry. Sorry, was that, so someone say memory groups? Yes, that's missing in squeeze. Um, but it will be there in future. Oh, there's another thing which didn't quite fit on this slide, which is GR security. Um, I can see there are useful features there. Um, the trouble is that upstream really doesn't like it. Um, there are odd uh, few features going in from GR security, um, but mostly it's, it's just a huge patch set. And it's quite intrusive. Um, so we'll have to carry on thinking about that. Um, so, another thing that people like that is not in tree, out of tree modules. Um, a necessary evil for some users. So we provide the development packages as I described before and we try to avoid changing API during a stable release so, um, that, so that there shouldn't be a need to rebuild these during the lifetime of a stable release. It's not always, we don't always succeed in that, but mostly. Um, there are two, uh, basically two ways these might be packaged. There's the dynamic kernel module system, uh, originally created by Dell, um, and as a result, it's supported by uh, a lot of Dell suppliers. Um, it's also, DKMS is also integrated into Ubuntu and SUS distributions, so Quite a few out of tree uh, modules are packaged this way. Possibly not as a dev, possibly as an RPM, but you can actually install those with Alien and it seems to work. Um, that will rebuild modules automatically. So if you install the development packages for a new kernel, uh, a new kernel version or API, then it will try to rebuild. Uh, you probably don't want to install and do uh, rebuilding on a, a production machine, um, but it does support uh, manually creating um, dev packages of the modules. There's also module assistant, um, which uh, always builds packaged modules, um, doesn't do automatic rebuilding. Um, one plus point, though, is it's, it's, uh, it changes the package name for each kernel ABI. Um, DKMS doesn't do that, which 
can make it hard to to um, to do um, parallel installation or uh, for multiple kernels. So, one more question from IRC. Um, Dilex asks, he proposed a patch set to enable real-time feature set for E386, um, AMD64 um, is enabled, already enabled um, with Linux 3.0 package. Corsac proposed a GRSec fe um, feature set. What's up with them? Well, as I said, it's somewhat contentious. It's, yeah. Um, you've mentioned uh, DKMS and Module Assistant. Um, would you care to recommend one over the other? Um, I would basically favor DKMS. That's kind of, that's kind of, kind of consensus uh, when we're at the kernel team last uh, discussed this. So returning to firmware files, most peripheral devices have a microcontroller. It's running non-free firmware. Um, even if you don't know, even if it doesn't require a firmware file, it's still running non-free firmware. Sorry. Um, so some of them require the host to load that, and several drivers in the kernel used to include these uh, the, the firmware, uh, which made the kernel non-free, which means it shouldn't be part of the Debian system. We sort of fudged this with general resolutions, making an exception for Etch and Lenny, and finally fixed this in Squeeze. But the bad news, of course, is a lot of users still have these devices that need non-free firmware. Pretty much any Wi-Fi card you can buy, uh, some network controllers, um, and all the uh, AMD Radeon GPUs. So the kernel team looks after this uh, package, which of course is not part of the Debian system. The firmware non-free uh, covers most of the firmware files that you're likely to need and that have uh, clear licenses to redistribute them. Unfortunately, some of the firmware that was uh, previously included inside drivers, it was in source files that said, this is uh, uh, released under GPL version two. And we don't have the source for the firmware. So that means we can't comply with the license. Um, the firmware files were also collected in a Git repository um, where the uh, uh, conditions for inclusion are less strict, let's say. Documentation, you need documentation for the kernel. Um, the system caller API is documented in man pages dev. Um, which is extremely high quality documentation. Um, you also have miscellaneous documentation of other features, uh, particularly uh, uh, what's in procfs, sysfs, and so on. Uh, that's documented somewhat uh, with, with somewhat uh, variable quality in the Linux doc uh, plus version number package. Um, the internal API of the kernel is also somewhat documented in a format called kernel doc. From that, we build manual pages in the Linux manual dash upstream version. Um, and there's also a package called the Debian kernel handbook that's um, maintained by some members of the kernel team. And it covers a lot of the Debian specific information, uh, the same sort of things that I've uh, talked about here. Uh, currently, it's all about Linux. It might reasonably be extensible to cover K3BSD and HERD. Uh, and on the wiki, um, the, the page name is Debian Kernel. Uh, despite the name, I believe that's all Linux specific uh, so far. So, more questions? So I'm experiencing a number of kernel bugs in Squeeze, and obviously I realize that the kernel team are hideously overloaded, and that my kernel isn't, the one that I'm running isn't very close to Linux upstream, and although I could you know, go head on and debug my kernel, I'm worried that if I do so, I might produce a patch that was no longer relevant to anybody. Um, what would you suggest as a 
general approach? Should I just live with my bugs? Well, should I, what should I do? Well, actually, the kernel in squeeze is fairly close to the um, long-term branch 2.6.32.y. Um, there are some bug fixes we've applied and a few features that haven't gone into there. But nevertheless, all of the bug fixes, and bug fixes and features we've applied are upstream in a later version. Um, of course, there may, be, there may be upstream changes that mean that you can't uh, fix a bug in the same way um, upstream and in, in, Debian, uh, and in Debian stable. But as a general rule of thumb, you would think it would be worthwhile debugging problems myself and reporting patches. I take it you'd prefer that than yes. just bug reports. If you, if you want to investigate and, and, and produce the patch against the, uh, our stable version, then you should send it first to us, and then we can look at how, does, how or if this applies to upstream. That's great. Thank you. Questions over there? A short question based on my experiences from the University of Oslo. Uh, with uh, Red Hat Enterprise, you will uh, always be in the situation where you can go back to a previous version of the kernel uh, when you uh, upgrade and uh, I really like this non-bridge-burning approach to kernel upgrades. Is there right. any hope that the Debian kernel will get you the same You want us feature? to change the package names more often? Every time there's a new kernel, yeah. I want a new different version, new, new packet name, so I can keep it in parallel with the old one. It's, yes, it's something I thought about. Um, it's quite problematic if you're getting these pulled in automatically uh, through the meta package um, because apt, apt will never auto remove kernel packages which is maybe was a sensible heuristic maybe still is um, but really, there's nothing, uh, nothing removing those, which means it would be pretty easy to fill up slash boot if it's a separate partition. Um, then you also have the problem of, well, if people have out-of-tree modules, how do you, um, how do you uh, make sure that those are available after the upgrade, which may well be a, an urgent security fix we insist people must install right away. We don't want to, to break their out-of-tree modules. Now, I know that um, Red Hat has a slightly different, um, well, I encourage people to do, uh, I think, kernel module packages, which are a different thing. Again, they're based on RPM. And they, I think, will symlink modules across if it looks like the ABI hasn't changed. So we could maybe think about doing something like that but we have to look very close, very carefully at how this would Im um, uh, impact on the uh, on DKMS and module assistant, um, and whether it would would uh, get in their way. Um, yeah. Um, I do not have a question, but a comment. I would like to encourage encourage the kernel team to. Uh, get all the Debian.org machines on kernels that are um, in our archive, so we more or less eat our own dog food, which we produce. We are doing quite, or well, you did quite well um, with the squeezy release, but there are still some machines that are running custom-built kernels. I'm aware of that. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Part of the problem, though, is that, um, as I said, you need different configurations for each ARM platform or, or, um, and for a lot of different MIPS platforms. And the build Ds currently, well, at least some of the build Ds are not fast enough to be able to build all those different flavors. So get us faster build Ds, uh, and we can add more flavors. <laughs> uh, I wanted to say that you asked something about the uh, last question as well. Um, in the Enid RamFS tools, you can already specify that you get a backup of the Enid RamFS when you create a new one. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it make sense to? create a backup of the kernel as well when it updates it to a compatible ABI 
Mm, that's, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, so I've been using 2632 and you're doing an amazing job of maintaining it and providing bug fixes and that's very great. But at some points I need um, features of newer kernels. So um, I'd like to have backports. Uh, so far what I was doing was installing the kernel uh, from unstable instead of rebuilding it. But it seems that uh, recently there have been some updates to initRMFS tools and some increased dependencies. So do you plan to provide uh, backports of kernels for squeeze? There or? are other people providing backports. Um, okay. In, in squeeze backports. Okay. Thank you. So one more question from IRC. Um, Dilex asks um, if, uh, if there is uh, documentation of the own build system from Debian kernel team. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Is there a documentation of the own build system um, from the Debian kernel team? Of the, old, oh, the what build? Of your own build system. Of our own build system. Um, use the source. Sorry. Okay, hi, uh, Matthias from Linux Magazine. Uh, what will the Linux kernel version for Debian Wheezy be? Um, is, it, is it going to be... <laughs> oh, this is dangerous. 3.0 uh, based? <laughs> it will be 3. something. Okay. Um, <laughs> at this stage, I would guess maybe 3.2. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I have one wish and one question. The wish is, um, could you please build the Linux K build packages also for the experimental packages so it's possible to install them and still have the take EMS like VirtualBox uh, compiling? And um, maybe. <laughs> And the question is, do you still plan to convert your packaging to Git, or is this plan um, postponed? We do have it as a long-term goal, and I really hoped it would have been done by now. Um, we will do it. No more questions? Okay. Um, do you already have an idea of uh, how much is going to change if you remove the uh, 2.6 from the package name and everything that it entails? Changing the source package names doesn't really mean anything for, um, for users. Okay. Um, the only uh, disruption I can see would be uh, the, way, the, the way bugs are tracked. Okay. Currently we have bugs tracked against Linux 2.6. Any bugs reported against existing binary packages will end up assigned to Linux 2.6. Um, but of course if the bug uh, hasn't been fixed, then it will still apply to the new Linux package. Um, so I'm not sure quite what we'll do there. Okay. Hello. Um, do you have any plans for a case splice, even though Oracle just bought it? No plans at all, no. I think maybe um, as a part of our contribution back to the free software community, it might be something that we as a project could look into to rescue that project. For those who don't know case splice, it is basically a way to patch your kernel without rebooting. And it would be pretty nice if we could use it. Okay, any more questions? <laughs> 
This is not so much a question as just uh, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate, I know you guys are doing a really big job and it's a critical job and there are lots of machines that I can maintain thanks to you. Um, so uh, I know it's hard and I know that there are problems and it sounds like there have been things people want from within the room that aren't happening yet, but I just want to let you know that it is very much appreciated, everything that you guys are doing. So thank you. Thank you.